We're continuing our journey into realism of understanding the world around us. We have selected Words for War, a collection of Ukrainian poetry that discusses about the challenges, the, the lifestyle that they live that is much different than what we live. Today, coming up on the Codex Cantina, we have two different poems that I feel like really kind of mesh together. A lot of similarities between them by Boris Humanik, and he's a very famous writer, poet, uh, now war hero, and artist as well. I looked him up on Facebook, and he's published some beautiful pieces of artwork, but uh, he's a pretty incredible human being. And uh, so shout out to him in these poems that are reminiscent of what's going on in his country today and seem to take us back to the past a little bit and have some relevance of that history seems to tend to repeat itself. And his stuff is spot on, I think, for the feelings of war and how sometimes we look at not just uh, the, the person, but the, the metaphorical or the, the allegories that we can see in poetry for the feelings of war and loss. So like some poets, Boris does not name his poet, so I'll just read the first line as, as the title in brackets here, When You Clean Your Weapon. When you clean your weapon, when time and again you clean your weapon, when you rub strong smelling oils into your weapon and shield it from the rain with your body when you swaddle it like a baby, even though you've never swaddled a baby before. You're only 19, no baby, no wife. The weapon becomes your only kin. You and the weapon are one. When you dig trench after trench, when you dig this precious, this hateful earth by handfuls, every other handful reaches your soul. You grind this earth between your teeth. You don't. You never will have another. You climb into the earth like into your mother's womb. You are warm and snug. You've never felt this close to anyone before. You and the earth are one. When you shoot, even when it's at night, and you don't see the enemy's face. Even when night hides the enemy from you and you from the enemy and embrace each of you as her own, you smell like gunpowder. Your hands, face, hair, clothing, shoes, no matter how much you wash them, smell of gunpowder. They smell of war. You smell of war. You and war are one. That was translated by Oksana and Maxim. We'll put their names down below. You know, one thing that I found amazing about poetry is that I've learned that they really hone in on the senses, right? And that smell is something that can trigger memories a lot of times. And Boris has been in the military in his country of Ukraine. And I think a lot of this is his experience when he has been fighting in 2013. Um, and that that smell must trigger memories for what he has gone through maybe in combat. And I, I recognize, you know, food or you, you have a memory and it takes you back to when you're a child. That gun oil must be so maybe paralyzing to him as an individual that it, it that smell seems to be a reoccurring theme in this poem. Yeah, and I can see that, right? I mean, we we can relate on totally different levels, but we've all had those experiences. Like maybe you've worked at a job, like whether as a waiter or at a grocery store and you come home and you know, this, this smell, right? Like this smell represents an experience and might and mind be a coming of age moment, whether it be you were working and, you know, learning what it means to be a contributing member of society. Now, Boris is much different, right? His smell is the idea of fighting for life, for freedom, for other people's lives. It's, uh, it's gotta be horrific because sometimes even when I go into a grocery store, so my, my first job was a grocery store and like, I, I, I smell like a, a particular smell. It's like the deli section. I don't know what it is about the deli section. Why would I smell like the deli at the grocery store? I didn't even work in the deli. I was a cashier. But like when I smell that, like I still kind of like I trigger back to that moment. Like I can't imagine what it's like to have a trigger to something like horrific, like what Boris and others have done in terms of surviving these types of wars throughout their lives. Yeah, and it does seem like a lot of times memories that are tied to smell are very polarizing. It's something that is very important, a defining part of your life, or it's something that is very, very positive, a uh, negative defining in your life. Uh, there's certain smells that take me back to my wedding day or there's certain smells that take me back to maybe losing a loved one or something. And yeah. I couldn't imagine that a smell would take me back to maybe some of the worst time in, in my life. 
that's that's got to be heartbreaking. That's got to be tough. And I, I understand why poetry is necessary as much as I still struggle with it. I'm enjoying it more. But I understand the necessity of it, that it is a way to cope with maybe something that was horrific in your life. Now, something else that happens in this poetry is he talks about the the gun as like a surrogate for uh, a baby, for a life, for a family, that sort of thing. And that kind of made me think about how when I look at back at 18, 19 year old Una, I was a much different person in terms of what I thought I could do and what I thought was important. And I think it's kind of interesting because Boris positions it almost like either or, right? Like you haven't had a family, you haven't had a kid. All you've had is this gun. So that's all you can know in your life. It's this argument from uh, experience, right? Like a lack of experience of you can't understand the, I don't know, is it an argument of, of love of is it argument of connection like what do you believe in i guess is is the value that you exchange when interacting with someone very personable like a family member like that and to replace something extremely what i think is valuable in terms of human interaction with another person something as intimate and close as a family member as a child and to replace that with a weapon like a gun and to say that's all you've known that's what you're going to be buried with all you know is war I thought was also very challenging to interpret uh, how different people's lives can be based on the uh, context in which they're born in the world. Wow, that's that's pretty heavy and deep. Um, I guess I took it two different ways. Again, and I'm so glad that poetry is open, more open to interpretation than some other types of literature. So one thing that I took about the gun was that he relates it to a baby, which is brand new life. And a gun is designed to take life. And he's melding those two together like they're one and the same. And that kind of blew my mind because I'm thinking, wow, like a, a gun, there is no other purpose. It is designed to take life. And that a baby being, what is what is their life going to be to say that they're the exact same mm. thing? It was very, very heartbreaking that he's saying this about a gun, that it's as intimate or as personal as, as life, or it's what hold, oh, wow. it, it, what's, it protects his life is this machine of death. And then I kept thinking about it, man, like all the other stories that we read, you, you've taught me this, that gun always represents manhood. And here he's kind of, rep I, I feel, I felt like this was not the norm. This is kind of breaking the mold of what a gun was, that it didn't represent his manhood. It was almost like anti-manhood, like, I don't want this gun, is kind of the sentiment that I felt about this this poem. Yeah. Well, it doesn't always have to represent, right? It just, a lot of times it can mean that. A lot of times guns are used that way. And I think you brought up a really good point that, like, the teleological design of a gun is to end. It's to shoot. It's to destroy, whether it be life, objects, threaten. And uh, I guess that's a really good question is what what do we view, whether whether you have a faith, whether you don't have a faith? Like, what is the teleological design of a human being? And I think you just positioned it, interestingly, as that to in which to create, that in which to provide value is directly opposed to the gun whose teleological design is to destroy, to create terror and that sort of thing. And I never kind of positioned those two that way. So I think that's a... I think that was a very interesting way to look at that, this part of the poem as well. I also think about Boris is participating in a war right now, and some of the wording that he uses, like trench and things, I've only read about in World War I, and Ukraine was very important in that part of the, the battle and the war and the fighting, and, and he's literally fighting for his life right now. And some of the, 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 the words that he uses is like, into your mother's womb, and a warm hug, and being snug, and... I feel sorry for this man. Like I, I think that he is very sad and depressed, and uh, I, I think that he just wants it to all be over and done. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe when he wrote this, he was a young man, uh, because it, I, I feel like age is something here. Is that we grow up and realize the sanctity of life and how valuable life is, and that maybe a young person can't appreciate that as much until they're pushed into war and they see mm -hmm. how horrific it is, and that the loss of life is never worth it. I don't know. It's very, very heartbreaking. Yeah, for sure. I, let's look at a, another poem of his because he's got several in this collection, this Words for War that we're selecting from. And both of these are available. You know, they've been published online. And uh, I think this one actually even has a ton of literary value too, on top of the emotional and perspective share that maybe this will inspire some people to maybe dig more into this author and, and see a different view. An old mulberry tree near Maripol 
has never seen so many boys in her life. Boys picking her fruit, boys dancing in the branches, and the smallest boy climbing to the very top. RPGs, a machine gun, sniper rifles, helmets, bulletproof vests, all laid carefully down. The boys laugh, gave each other piggyback rides, smeared mulberry juice all over their faces, sometimes on purpose, to look like characters from Hollywood movies. RPGs, a machine gun, sniper rifles, helmets, bulletproof vests, all laid carefully down. Beyond the horizon, some mortars went to work, making a funny noise. One, two, three, one. Like a young lover knocking on a girl's window. A flock of ravens rose into the sky with a shriek. But maybe those weren't ravens. Maybe those were airborne clumps of earth tilled by the explosions. The boys abandoned the old mulberry tree, left it whirling in a solitary dance, changed into grown men. They sped off to assume their positions beyond the horizon, where the earth cried out to the sky, and the sky shook. The old mulberry tree is waiting for her boys by the road, but nobody comes to pick her fruit. It falls to the ground like bloody tears. The grass was pressed beneath the RPGs, machine gun, sniper rifles, helmets, bulletproof vests, all straightened out. And when the moon rises in the sky, the old mulberry tree gets on her tiptoes like a girl, tries to peek over the horizon. Where are you, boys? I keep coming back to the image of the tree, and if you go to Boris's uh, Facebook page and you scroll back to uh, early February before the conflict, the war in Ukraine today, you'll see that he posted a, a painting, and it's of a tree, and it really spoke to me, and I kept having that image, and it almost looks like the tree is a person as well. And I think of the tree as the mother, and that there's this loss of life and the loss of innocence for these boys as they go off to war. They leave their mother. They leave their family. They leave their childhood behind. And they're going off to all of these horrible things, the RPGs, the weapons, the vests. And they're leaving behind fun games and moving into war, which is horrific. And they are going through a soldier's journey. A lot of time we talk about a hero's journey. And I feel like this poem was more of a soldier's journey of of loss or life, but is it really their story or is it the tree story who I felt like was was the family left behind that's going to lose their young men? And we see in sometimes war, entire generations are wiped out. Millions of young men lose their lives in these wars that sometimes feel needless. And it, oh, man, I just, I, I, I don't know. You go. Before how did, I start crying. How did <laughs> how did you how did you take the because you'll notice there's like that repeating part where they say the RPGs, a machine gun, sniper rifles, helmets, bulletproof vests. Did you notice the first two times it's read, it ends with all laid carefully down. Right, the first two times it ends with that. But did you notice the third time after they go off to war, it says all straightened out. Why do you uh, think they changed the ending there after they went to war? Do you think that represents the death or it's all, it's it's right after the line it falls so but nobody comes to pick her fruit it all falls to the ground like bloody tears No oh, yeah so that's yeah I that, that's got to be death the loss of the the young men And w- I'm still learning about how to look at Ukrainian culture and how much does you know Shakespeare or Ovid and metamorphosis kind of impose or kind of influence their thinking cuz I don't know what mulberry trees if they represent anything in Ukrainian like culture. But I do know from like, you know, Pyramus and Thisbe, we've talked about this before, the the Romeo and Juliet, two people who are forbidden to love, right? And we we look at the the boys being sent out to war here and the mulberry tree being a female representative in this story, right? She's looking out for her boys in a sense, and the boys climb on her. And it's a forbidden love because the boys are called away to war here. And in Pyramus and, Pyramus and Thisbe, right, the ending basically ends with them dying underneath this tree. And the, the the legend is basically, since it was kind of like this death under the mulberry tree, their blood uh, stained the white berries of the mulberries to red. Like that's, that's kind of like this lore, this myth about why mulberries uh, have like the red blood seeds, quote unquote. So if you look at this story... We have like that line right before the the vests are laid out that her her fruit falls to the ground like bloody tears. 
you know, the, the two lovers, the star-crossed lovers that couldn't ever connect. And what is it that called the boys away? It's war, right? That's what's forbidden love in, in, in a way, an, an interpretation of this, this poem. And I think that's very powerful. One last thing, and I just kind of thought about this uh, as, as you were talking about that. What if we took this literal and that a lot of this is the bombing and the earth shook the old mulberry tree, the literal bombing of their their cities, and mm. the, the the falling down is is the the, the bombs, the weaponry, uh, the missiles and stuff, and that's maybe why he keeps coming back to the weaponry imagery, and you get that you know three different you know stanzas, I guess they are in the poem of repeating those weapons. Maybe it is taken more literally. I just kind of thought about that. Yeah, great, great. Both of these, just wonderful poems from Boris. And there, there's a couple other in the collection. I'll, I'll put a link down below if you're interested in checking it out. So I, I so far, I, I'm really enjoying, from a realism standpoint, of trying to look at how maybe my life differs from other people out there and what that means. And I think that's an important reflection we all need to take in times like this, where we don't all have the freedom to have these thoughts right now. I think it comes together that, like many of these poems, is that we're all one in this world together, uh, this spaceship of Earth, and that what one person does can affect another, and that you know if this is the only thing we can do to help, then that's what we do, and we don't stop trying to help each other. So we will be back with some more selections from this book. I don't know what they're going to be just yet, but uh, I think what this will be kind of like a little bit of a rotating round for a little bit here as we're trying to dive into and process our lives right now. So uh, thank you for hanging out with us as we post videos every Monday and Thursday. My name is Ben Una. Call for peace. Peace. <laughs>